In 2011, the forests uh, in the eastern region put together these little summaries of what they did for in behest of non-native invasive species. They talked about worms and bad carp and all of the yucky stuff that's out there. And they did a one or two page compilation, which we put on the, on the web. And um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that again in 2012. And these are handy because they show people what, uh, what is being involved, how other people might partner and you know, write off this money together. Um, so it's out there and it's on this web. And if you've not seen this website, it is a really useful tool for all kinds of folks. I would encourage you to go there, start to mine into it. It's all public domain. All the images are free for lifting, used with, without any remorse or concerns. Um, so that's where the reports are. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about the reports. Here's the Schwamigan Nicolais. And in, again, one page is on that site. And these reports were done by our botanists primarily, I'm not sure they uh, are, are really nice, nice, nicely done um, items. Um, I took a minute to just summarize some of the things that these forests were doing. It is not all inclusive. I just threw it out there because it, I thought it might be interesting. The Schwamigan Nicolet has now 100% coverage on that whole forest by CWMAs, and they have a number of them. Um, and they're here today to uh, interact with you folks and be happy to talk about things. They did portable boat washings. That's a really big deal in our part of the world. And I've been to some Western conferences where I hear people in Montana talk about quagga mussels and zebra mussels, and people in, in, in Arizona talking about those things. Of course, it was courtesy of uh, the lakes, you know, and St. Lawrence Seaway and St. Lawrence River that that stuff came to us, but I'm sort of like this when I hear it from them because it's a huge issue. So the boat washing operation is, is, is wonderful. Um, they surveyed things, uh, 500 miles, gravel pits, outreach, two new uh, plants that were documented um, in early detection and rapid response, which is, which is a big deal to find some of these new things that haven't gone all over yet. And the folks that I'm remembering were involved in this, Linda Parker, Nicole Schutt, uh, Matt Bushman, Steve Janke, uh, Margie Briskevich, Ann Hofferly, Melissa Simpson, and some other folks. So super work, super work. And then we'll go to the Ottawa. I will talk about some of the high points. Again, I'm not really doing justice to any of these, but uh, conservation districts, Friends of the Sylvania Wilderness, Kiwana Bay Indian Community, Yellow Dog, uh, watershed Preserve, Lake Associations, Conservation Corps, uh, surveying and, and working in wilderness areas, biocontrol. The Ottawa also has 100% coverage uh, as per the CWMAs. That, that's amazing. Uh, surveys for lakes and again the boat washing, washing station scenario, which is a big deal. So good luck, or rather good work, Ian and Sue Trout on the Ottawa. Uh, Hiawatha, again, you can find that on the website and what they've done. Cooperative weed management areas, 100% coverage, really cool partners, lots of work done on Grand Island as well as other people, places. They did some boat cleaning on Grand Island, biocontrol for knapweed, uh, non-native invasive species control in plant sites. It's all about habitat. And gravel and on and on and on. Um, Deb LeBlanc and uh, Stephanie Bloomer. Good, good job. And here on Manistee, we have our one representative from the here on Manistee. Um, here's some, just thumbnail sketch of some of the things that those folks did. Uh, CWMAs, 
Not 100% coverage, but, but getting there. They have grown tremendously. I put on this one an example of some of the species they were controlling that all look familiar, I'm sure, to you. In contrast to our southern tier forests in my region, it's, it's some of these, but there's some interesting others, you know, stilt grass and kudzu and other things. So uh, again, uh, priority acres uh, in rare plants and the folks that were working on that, um, people like Pat McGann, Carolyn Henney, Sierra Patterson. Um, okay, the other thing that we're starting to do in the eastern region of the forest is we, we took the wonderful best management practices that the state of Wisconsin did. Tom Booz sent me the PD, PDF, PD, PDL, PDL for those, and we retrofitted it, and now we're trying to make them as guidance as our own for the region. Guidance. If somebody else has got some, if a forest or district has another way of controlling these things, wonderful. But we're putting them out there as guidance so that we can get on with the, with the issue related to best management practices. The take home on this being, it's really easier to control the stuff and cheaper beforehand by cleaning equipment and all that drill than trying to pick it up and get rid of it afterwards. If for no other reason, then we're running out of money for this. So that, that's the take home, and we expect to see those guidances um, 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 as the retrofitting from Wisconsin, which I had one guide that I brought, but you can find those on the website. So here are the Wisconsin guidelines, and you can make those your own as well. I haven't seen a lot of other eastern region states adopt these yet, construct these. Vermont has. I've heard that the folks in Indiana are farther along too, but beyond that, I, I, I don't know of a lot of individual state BMPs. It would be easier if each state had something. Because we don't, that's why we retrofitted this for our region. So they developed forestry, recreation, urban forestry, transportation. Um, and I think they were really thoughtful. They're really good, good guide. Um, and there they are. You can go on the web, you can get them. They, um, you can print them out. They had booklets that Tom sent us um, that just wonderfully uh, well done. So. I'm reaching just about the end of this, and I wanted to take a minute to ask, I mean, because I'm asked this all the time, especially as money shrinks away more and more, what, why do we care? Um, what's at stake? Well, I'll, I'll throw out a few things that come to mind for me in this world. We know that, we know that the environment is in a continual state of flux. We know that nothing is forever. We do know that um, climate change looms very large. And um, we should be thinking about getting ready for this, um, saving the parts to allow these new ecosystems that will emerge from this to recalibrate. They won't look like the ecosystems that we have now. There's a part of me that feels really sad about that. I don't like that. <laughs> but we want to save the parts so that what evolves has as many parts as it can to evolve into that new community. And I call it like a recalibration. We know that invasive species wreak havoc on natural communities and uh, the natural plants and animals that reside therein. And we know that natural communities provide some pretty amazing ecosystem services that we should not try to do without at all. Um, pollination is one, there are many, many more, but um, Non-native invasive species aren't always great shakes for native pollinators or even honeybees. It, it's, not a, it's not an equal 
equal serving <laughs> each way. Um, so that, that's, that's cause for concern.